Welcome to On the Metal, Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. I'm Brian Cantrell. With me, as always, is Jess Frizzell. Hey, Jess. Hey, Brian. And joining us is our boss, Steve Duck. Hey, Steve. Excited to be here. All right, keep us in line. And Jess, you want to introduce who we've got in the garage today? So today we have Ron Minnick, who I like to refer to as the godfather of open firmware, but I'm not sure if you'd even like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's super exciting. Uh, we're in the garage as usual. Ron, welcome to the garage. It's great to have you. It's an honor to be here. So, well, first of all, the godfather of open firmware, do you find that disparaging or not? I, I, I view it as certainly praise, but hopefully you view that as, how do you view that? There's probably more than one. Okay. Yeah. So, so do you want to, maybe that's a good place to start about, yeah. like, about where open firmware, because you were certainly at the birthplace of open firmware in a lot of ways. How did that come about? How did you, uh, where did you see the need and how'd you feel it? Actually, it's weird. It, my uh, hope of doing that work started in the early 90s with Sun Microsystems Systems. When I looked at the Netboot program they had at the time, realized it was a quarter meg. And a lot of it was sort of, Sun would take these scripts and run them on their kernel and extract drivers from the kernel and compile them into the Netboot program. And we took one look at that and thought, well, why don't we just like put the kernel in the flash? And that's when we hit the hard wall of, well, because it's licensed and the right. flash is too small and all these other problems applied. So that went on the shelf from about 1990, 1991. And in the intervening time, I actually helped design a PCI card. And that's when I realized PCI had self-defining hardware, which meant we were done with dip switches and jumpers and special knowledge and all that. And it was that not the first self-defining hardware bus, but it was the first commodity one. Right. And so in 99, I, I had this god-awful VA Linux cluster with these Intel L440 GX motherboards that took five minutes to boot. And if you needed to reflash the firmware, you had to rip the thing open and physically move a jumper and put it in a floppy disk that ran an auto exec dot bat. Oh my God. That <laughs> Ran, but because it was a sort of backup 64K firmware that burned the real firmware, you didn't have video or keyboard, <laughs> which meant that their instructions were put the floppy in, watch its LED light, listen for a couple beeps. Pray. Everything will be pray. <laughs> Praying was not in a manual, but it was in the activity, and you'll be fine. And and so this, this was so terribly awful oh on gosh. every possible dimension that I thought, first off, wow, we've got a quarter meg flash part in there more than big enough to hold a Linux one, well, 2.2 kernel at the time. We have self-defining hardware. Developer.intel.com actually has chipset data sheets. It's no longer true, but it was true back then. And uh, the pieces are all here in place that we could actually write a C-based thing that would load a Linux kernel into RAM and jump to it. The original Linux BIOS was intended to be about five instructions, which was take this thing in flash, copy it to RAM, and jump to it. And what I hadn't, didn't realize when I started the project is that wouldn't work anymore because DRAM was actually a little more complicated to set up by then. It was synchronous DRAM. There were clocks and things that had to happen. So Linux BIOS grew a little bit from there. And then the kernel kept getting bigger. And, you know, but, you know, we managed to kind of make that all work for a few years. That's amazing. And so at a time when DRAM training was getting more complicated, so where did you get the DRAM training code? Did you? Uh, Stefan Reinauer wrote that. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So pretty sure it was Stefan. Um, there were a lot of us looking at it, but, you know, by the time the Optron came along, which needed DRAM training, you know, again, the SDRAM, you just really needed to read the serial presence detect bits, do a computation jam them in a register, you were done. There really kind of wasn't training on SDRAM, but DDR brought in the idea of training and that just complicated our life a lot. So we had really smart people like Ying Hai Lu, who was, I think, at Tyan for a while and then AMD, who got involved. Of course, Eric Biederman, of course, Stefan Reinauer. And I would have to really go do a git blame on the tree to really remember actually who, who really wrote the real training code. I only know it wasn't me. Well, and I just feel like D DRAM training is one of those things that, I mean, as programmers, we take DRAM for granted. Yeah. And it's like, how complicated can it be to actually like get DRAM 
booted effectively. It's like, well, glad you asked. As it turns out, it can be quite complicated. Yeah, so probably in the early 2000s with DDR, it was um, order of several million instructions. I, I timed it on a- Whoa. Yeah, instruction times, I should say, because there's a lot of loops. Right. I timed it on a Chromebook uh, in 2012 when I joined Google. And at that by that point, it was up to billions of instructions. And, and so it, it, it's so bad and so slow, in fact, that typical BIOS will try and cache the computed parameters for DRAM training so that it doesn't have to do it more than once. Because uh, there, there's a large, large chunk of time minimum on a server system, 10 seconds maybe, that is DRAM training. Wow. It's a long, long time. That's a long time. Now, compared to UEFI, it's really fast because UEFI is 10 minutes. So it, UEFI is 60 times slower than the DRAM training step, but, you know, still, it's a long time. Well, and as someone who has never ventured into that kind of code, but who has suffered from a pandemic of DIM failures, you really do wonder how robust that is to, I mean, because you're basically on the fly trying to determine the right parameters for this thing. Yeah. Over time, presumably the system can change and invalidate those parameters at some level, you would think, or, or that you'd think that would be at least a possibility. Um, you know, and I don't have I don't have the knowledge of that part of it, right? I, once you compute like a Chromebook, you know, they compute the parameters, and and actually the ARM Chromebook, it'll come with say eight or four predefined sets of parameters. So based on that, I would guess that you know, in, in, in some of these systems, it doesn't really once you know it, it doesn't drift that much. Right, right, right. Uh, well, it's still, it's it's just amazing that, that all of the work that's required, the billions of instructions that are required to get a part working that yep. we just take for granted. Yep. And a little more disturbing is the fact that even though we opened that up in the early 2000s because the vendors decided a few years later they didn't want that to be opened up, it, it's now behind the wall of a binary blob. Right. So I always viewed Linux BIOS and then Coreboot in part as sort of this open source reservoir of knowledge, right? Do you want to know how to do DRAM training? You can look at our code. You can see how it works. And, and that, sadly, is, is sort of falling behind the veil of binary blobs. Yeah. It's a problem. Well, when, Jess, when, we, when you and I were at the Open Source Firmware Conference, Ron, obviously with you and crew, which was, it was a terrific conference. And I was telling Jess, it reminded me of like an old school conference because it is, it's using open source as that repository of knowledge, mm -hmm. which it, that's used to be true in an all proprietary era. It's become less true for the world writ large but it still really is true for, for firmware. It is. Yeah, there. that's why I love that conference so much. I, I I tell the people involved in all those projects, and as far as I'm concerned, it's the best conference I go to every year because people show up with soldering irons. Uh, it was so yeah, great. The, the hackathon was honestly the coolest part because, because of that, like you don't see that at any other conference that I've been to at least. Well, I also feel that yeah. like that was the spirit of open source. You know, there was a, there was a time yeah. when the, in an all proprietary world, you would go to these conferences and you'd be delighted by, oh my God, there are 200 people that are interested in the same thing I'm interested in. And it yeah. felt so arcane and the, the social networking was so much fun. And now we're in this era where people are kind of exhausted by pull requests. And, it's you like know. more commercialized versus the grassroots. The grassroots open source is like my favorite open source. Yeah. Well, actually, one of the reasons I started the Uroot project, which we now use in our in our open source firmware work at Google and other places, it was the last time I tried to do a build root and it failed. And I watched just this gigantic, massive stack of config files fail to work correctly. So to there are really two barriers. There's the binary blob barrier, which has kind of come back. But unfortunately, I feel in the open source community, one of the other barriers is we've just built these gigantic stacks of, of scripts and scripts and scripts. And it's very hard sometimes to get behind the wall of all that stuff and find out what's really going on. And, and so the goal with Uroot, I know I'm diverging a little, but the goal with Uroot was to get back that sense we had in the early Unix days right. that, that I would say, oh, where's cat? Oh, there's the source to cat right there. Not, oh, apt get cat, which I think is 
you know, <laughs> it's wonderful that the right. source for cat right. can be found. Yeah. It's, it's not wonderful that, that yeah. very few people ever look at that stuff. When well, then you're right. like apt to get cat and it's like, okay, I'm going to download 431 megs. Yes. It's like, oh my God. And it's like, we've got dependencies on, it's like, how is this? I mean, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's a complicated world. And you do wonder, is there a simplicity that we could be realizing that we're not realizing that certainly Unix. I mean, that way it's it's a pun on Multics, right? I mean, I, I actually think ask anyone if they ever use the where is command. Where is command is a command you used to run to tell you where the source to the command was, right? And and one of the goals that we've had, we are in some sense growing up again. Like you know, our work doesn't end at the at the at the BIOS barrier, right? The goal is to make things accessible again in a way a source. And and so my ideal system is I type where is. And Gen 2 is somewhat in that spirit, but Gen 2 is an enormously complex system that very few people I know really understand, to be honest. I, I love what they want to do, but wow, I'll type where is and I'll immediately see a command and it's small and short and concise and it builds in a quarter second. That's the way I feel it ought to be. Uh, yeah. I, I actually, I love Gen 2. I, I used it for a long time to make like this custom OS, which is, which is how also like Chrome mm -hmm. OS is made. And I think it's like perfect for that that use case because the static binaries, compiling an OS with just static binaries, I don't know, that was my goal. I love static binaries. Yeah. I, in fact, Uroot is built around that whole idea that binaries should be static. Nice. So I'm with you on that one totally. Sorry, can I ask what Gen 2 is? Oh and boy. there's the Gen 2 problem yeah, right in a yeah, nutshell. That is the Gen 2 problem in a nutshell. I assume it's not generation, second no, generation. And that's, no, this is not you. This is Gen 2. This is not, this is, a, this is an entirely reasonable question. But the fact that, that you, you, you know about Ubuntu and you know about CentOS and these other things, but Gen 2, you're like, what, what the hell is that? Yeah. My favorite Gen 2 meme, though, this is very subculture of Gen 2. It's that when you are trying to compile GCC, like you're st just starting out like your, your kind of distribution, like you have to go all the way to Germany and back basically to like get the source code for GCC and compile the world, which I think is a funny So you thing. should explain for, for Steve <laughs> what the zeitgeist is of Gen 2 with the... Yeah, you build everything from scratch. Like everything is from like almost first principles of like building artifacts. So you have to compile everything from source, including the compiler itself. Which, which is kind of like a chicken and egg problem yeah. because like mm -hmm. you need a compiler to compile the compiler. And it's excruciating. <laughs> and th there's something that is obviously very, uh, very satisfying about building a system from first principles, but the fact that it is so difficult to build a system from first principles today, and that's, I mean, in GCC, boy, in an LLVM world, it's even more complicated. Yeah. And, you know, Ron, as you know, I'm a huge fan of Rust, but the the big complexity with Rust is getting LLVM to work. I mean, right. the, the, there is so much working. And, and once you can get that working, you are opened up to this new kind of simplicity, but there's a lot of complexity in yep. getting, uh, getting just the compiler to compile yeah. is, that, is excruciating. That's where I think Ken Thompson's C compiler from Plan 9 is an incredible lesson in compactness. It compiles in about a second or two. It's about, well, it's under 24 files. Interesting thing in there is he actually doesn't use the C library. Old school. True no, old no, school. no. It's actually about... Does, does, he, does he make system calls? Yeah, but it's the trusting trust thing. The thing is if huh. you pull the C library in as part of your compiler, you, there's there's kind of an introduction of a vulnerability there. Right. And what Ken realized is he can, he can make that C compiler, and I'm reading into what he did, so maybe I'm wrong, but you can kind of make the C compiler a standalone entity that doesn't pull in any libraries. And it's kind of a neat idea to do it that way. So he has a couple of system calls. He only has four. The thing I totally love is his malloc is an S break and his free isn't empty. Right. Free nice. doesn't ever happen because, well, you're not ever going to get big enough that it matters. Well, and it is kind of like a hardware root of trust analog mm -hmm. for compiling. Like mm -hmm. we want to have this thing, this one compiler that is super simple. Mm -hmm. And then we will use this compiler that we can reason about and we can verify putatively. Yep. To actually then begin to bootstrap the world and, and build a much more complicated world. Yep. And actually every go through go 1.3 was actually based on the Ken C compiler. Right. Yeah. The trust of trust paper is actually one of my favorite papers because well, uh, it's very short, simple, and then it's just like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Trusting trust. Like it, it goes down to first principles again of what you're building. And it really had to go to firmware, actually. Because you, you trust all this firmware and it's all really very bad code. You, yes, it was not designed to be at the bedrock of humanity the way it is, certainly. Right. So what was your first exposure to the to Plan 9 and the Unix philosophy? I mean, obviously, 
Was that, oh. is that Los Alamos or before? I think I'll date myself. My first exposure to playing uh, Unix was 1976. There you go. On and what machine? That is version, be th- version 6 on an 1145. And, uh, nice. Yeah. And you, the thing about, I wouldn't trade that the time spent with that for anything. We were, we were so circumscribed by the limits of the machine. You really had to think through what you were doing. And, and again, Ken is the master at this, all of Ken's code through, you know, the present day. I don't know think he's written recently, but you still see it signature bits of Ken and, and I, it's hard to describe, but it's sort of the code that can kind of fold in on itself and do something additional in addition to its, you know, the purpose it was described for. I don't, I don't possess the mathematical skill to kind of define the way his code works, but you kind of know it when you see it. Oh, interesting. And, and, and so you see, you see a function, but then you see, you know, maybe multiple functions calling that and, and getting different behaviors, you know, in ways you wouldn't think of. So Unix back at that time, because of all the limits we lived with, made us think very, very, very hard about how you did things. And, and the result was, you know, you, you tended to write tight, and the code had to be clean, but tight, fast code. And so the, uh, this 1145, where is it? Is this at a, a school or where? Uh, I gave the front panel to a friend of mine, but this was a University of Delaware back in the day, yeah. Okay, so you're yeah. a university student, I assume. Yeah, yeah, I was a, yeah. And first exposure to computer, 1976, that's probably your first computer at that point, right? Or No, nah, believe it or not, 69 was my first computer. I wrote my first program 50 years ago. Okay, well, we got to, all right, we got to talk about that. What computer is that? That sounds uh, cool. It was- uh, 1969, okay. At home? So, well, and I built a little relay computers and things to it. So I hungered for more than eight bits of memory because that's all I ever built in my relay computers. But- uh, yeah, it was basic HP 2100 leased machine from a company called Leasco. Leasco? It's long gone, long okay. gone. Le- and, and it was an ASR 33 paper tape punch and reader. Nice. Yeah. And, That's cool. And, but, and you had this at home somehow? No, 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 that was in my high school. In your high school, I, okay. But they, well, it was a high school course and I had to like petition to get in because I was 12 and they didn't want me to <laughs> be doing that when I was 12. So, Yeah. So I, I had, you know, I had the usual things that a lot of people wanting to do computers back then had. I had a Dr. Nim for anyone who knows what a Dr. Nim is. No, what's a Dr. Nim? Yeah. A Dr. Nim, I'll, I'll bring it in sometime. It was a plastic device that played the game in Nim. And the flip-flops were actuated by marbles. So in some sense, the marble was sort of this, the, the input bit to these three plastic flip-flops. And um, it taught you a lot about even though you didn't know you were being taught, it taught you a lot about sort of digital logic. This was a company called ESR, started in New Jersey. They built four different kinds of digital devices cast in plastic. Where are these wow. today? We got to, I mean, yeah, I I these are like, one. One of those. yeah, this is got to put something on the Christmas list for the kids. I have three of them. Oh my God. I never got the fourth one. They went out of business. The first was Dr. Nim. The next was Thinkadot. The next was, and I really, uh, geez, it's on my list to kind of recover my poor little Digicomp one. The Digicomp one is what taught me De Morgan's theorem, Boolean algebra, that kind of thing. It was wow. a three flip-flop device and you would realize the and and or of the state machine with these little plastic, believe it or not, little bits of plastic tubing. And then there were these, you know, you define your logic equations and a clock was this thing you moved back and forth. Oh my really gosh. You had a clock printed on it. And then you'd watch the three bits change value as these these things. Oh my god, back. that's incredibly valuable. They are still available. They are not cheap. Whoa. Yeah. Are they? I, 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 you should be able to buy a reproduction. Well, because of these them. are these are originals. Yeah. yeah, these are originals that people yeah. are selling online. What a great idea, though. Because because I remember when I certainly when I was coming up in the eighties, yeah. that was that was not a thing, unfortunately, anymore. Yeah, and I just remember being. I, you know, as a young kid, thinking like I don't understand how we've built computation on binary logic, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. and getting an intuition for that at, at such kind of a, a physical level is great. That's a it's a yes. great idea. I mean, it's it it was really uh, well, it got me started right, and 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 it, and so I kind of was a hardware designer for a long time while I was also doing software because of the Digicomp one. If I could find those guys and 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 thank them. Which right. I, I don't know where they are anymore, who they were even. They're in Wikipedia as ESR. Wow. There you go. Yeah, uh, that's wow. Dr. Nim. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Nim was wonderful, you know, because you it, you, you really would 
If you'd hung on to a couple of them, they've been marked up to 145 bucks a piece now. And uh, you know, uh, d- d- cheap, listener, cheap at 10 times the price for the educational value, totally. right? And so, dear listener, Steve has done what you might well be doing, is just going to the Wikipedia page and-, and Googling ESR Dr. Nim. That we'll is, put yeah. it in the show notes. It, we'll put it in the show notes for sure. That's the, But that's amazing. What yeah. a great first exposure. And so that is in the, it sounds like mid 60s. Yeah, I think, so the other sort of very early sort of learn about computers thing I got was called the Geniac which was literally perf board rotary dials and you would do plug board things and, you know, you would uh, set up logic equations and do stuff. And There's then something I, great about the EAC era of like the, oh, yes. the, the, the Iliac, the, 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 the Johnniac, all this stuff. The, the Geniac now, that's great. But again, it, it, it's these, these um, I think when you have limits, it's, it's good, right? Because you have to really think it through. Carefully. The Geniac designed and developed by Edmund Berkeley. All right. Really? And, and, and you know, this isn't like, this hasn't ended. There, there's an artist in France who designed this incredibly beautiful digital clock. And she built all the flip-flops using LEDs. And, and, and so, I, and I've lost, I've lost the, the reference, right? But it's about six or eight feet tall. And, and it's just, you can kind of watch the computation as it occurs yeah. in this digital clock. And, and so even were we not to do this stuff with plastic, this stuff could be done with in ways that make it visually clearer what's going on. Especially because the atomic particles of computation have not changed. Yeah. I, it, for all of the talk of, you know, quantum computing and the very poorly named, I mean, I guess terrifically named from their perspective a quantum supremacy. I hate that term because it makes my, you know, my, my mom's, <laughs> my mom's book club is contemplating ritual suicide because, uh, because Google has achieved quantum supremacy. It's like, oh God. But Tom, the, people are reading too much Tom Clancy, I think, right? It's, it's, oh, supremacy. You know, it's exactly. Just, too much. It's just, it, but meanwhile, give me a break. Yeah. back in the reality of a stored program computer and a von Neumann architecture, which is still what we're living with, these are still the atomic particles, yeah. and it is still deeply, in fact, more so than ever in an era where we are further removed from that to be able to actually like physically understand and get an intuition for what's actually happening on this. That's yeah. terrific. I think that's why it's pretty funny. When we did the work in 1999 on Linux BIOS, I had a lot of people from vendors say, you can't write a BIOS in C. <laughs> and, 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 and about five years later, they said, well, thanks to Ron who showed us we could write a BIOS in C. Well, first off, <laughs> I'd, I'd written a BIOS in a better language than C in 1978. So I knew I could write it in C. And secondly, arguably, Unix in many ways was a bi- lives in yeah, the right. place of a BIOS, right? And, and so it was just so bizarre to me yeah. to hear these companies make this statement. I, I just, I, I, I couldn't understand why anyone would believe that? So that's but. actually a very interesting point that when that you're kind of mentally saying, look, on an 1145, the the, the the limited resources that that thing has, yeah, that effectively is firmware. That was firmware. We yep. we had Unix on it. We absolutely know that we can do Unix on a certainly on you know given the the luxury that we that we have I even mean, in the mid nineties. A 40k instruction space was about all you got, right? For Unix. And what's interesting, when I look at sort of what people want you to do to discover interrupt routing today in ACPI, which is you run the <laughs> ACPI machine language, quote oh unquote, virtual yeah. machine yeah. to evaluate ACPI bytecodes and you can't find interrupts any other way. Well, the way you did it on those old machines is you basically literally poked a register somewhere and waited to be kicked in the ass, <laughs> basically. And then you said, whoa, I just got an interrupt. Wonder what vector it was. Oh, must be that device that I just poked to interrupt me. Because you had no other way to find out what interrupt it was. You just didn't. And so, you know, you look at that and then you look at what vendors come up with today, which is megabytes of software to do almost the same thing. Right. And, you know, we've kind of lost a lot of the the idea of simplicity. And what we tend to go to is... um, Every time anything gets a little tricky, and I see this all the time, uh, the response is, we'll put a firmware driver in place to paper over the mess. Yeah. Right? So we've made a mess. Let's put something in firmware to paper over the mess and don't tell anyone. 
Yeah, and then it never really, speak of it. It, it, it really kind of takes a, a, a lightning bolt to kind of have that simplicity cut through all that complexity because we accept that complexity as endemic and required. Right. And there's no other way to do it. Right. And it's like, you know, you can't do a bias in C because there's no other way to do it. You have to do assembly. You have to do assembly. And it really, it's, it's difficult to overcome that inertia and be, and, and I also, it has, gives well, you great reverence for what Ken and co did with Unix in, in, in terms of being able to have such powerful abstractions on such uh, small hardware, so, well, such and, limited resources. And the key was the abstractions. The, you know, the, it's, it's so critical to pick the right abstractions. And, and this is one thing I think that's a little bit missing sometimes in the Linux discussion, which is it's, it's an absolutely brilliant piece of engineering. There's no way of getting around that. But there were a lot of competing operating systems to Unix in the early 70s. You know, why did Unix win? Yeah. They picked the right abstractions. They, and, 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 you know, the abstraction was arguably that you could enumerate the resources in, in, the, in the namespace, so to speak, because it was all there in the file system. That was really novel, right? The fact that dev TTY was the thing was incredibly novel. You know, if you look at Windows NT today, there's still sort of you name things with paths, but you, you can't LS those paths. That won't work. So, so the, the fact that you could cat a file and it would be a disk, right? Or you'd be writing to a printer or it'd be a tape or it'd be a real file or a TTY and it didn't matter. Right. You'd be surprised how often people kind of don't get that point today. As, and, it uh, as it turns out, like open, read, write, LSEQ, it's a very powerful yeah. abstraction. Yeah. And being able to, we can, we can put a lot through that abstraction. Yeah, we can. And, and so then, so segueing, actually, you, you mentioned Plan 9. I started hearing about Plan 9 around 88 or so and, you know, read all the papers and was just, all I could think is, this is, this is really cool. This feels like Unix again. And right. Right, Bear in mind, this is only a dozen or so years after I started using Unix. But um, by then, Unix has become a monolith. By I mean, it's, it's become oh, by even, even the late '80s, Unix ha has oh yeah has diverged. I mean, it's like it's amazing how just how quickly the pigs were walking on their hind feet. Yep. Right with respect to the Unix was going to throw out all this complexity, and it's, it's, you know it's actually it's a little bit. I have to say it's a little bit like the microservices revolution today, where microservices came and we're going to you know we're going to throw out all this complexity, of the monolith. We're going to replace it with the yeah. simplicity. Well, it doesn't take too long before that complexity grows again and metastasizes again, and the simplicity now is complicated. Yeah, I mean, so at some point the Unix did bring in. A few good ideas in the 80s, like the idea of a synthetic file system. That was key. And, and if you kind of look, I, one of these talks I give is, um, you, know, you know, why did Plan 9 happen? And it's pretty funny. If you go back to about 1978, when they brought TCP and networking into Unix, there were a lot of discussions about how to do that. And you actually can find an RFC where someone says, let's put it in the file system namespace. Dev TCP harv. You can actually find that string, oh, right? But looking huh. back on it, we didn't really have the mental model. We didn't have the abstractions that would really let us do that. And, and Rob Pike gave a fantastic talk one time about how you can go wrong kind of with, with naming. For example, dev TCP harv as an example, putting a host name in that path didn't actually make sense because the question became, if I move dev TCP harv to dev TCP prep, which is the MIT machine, what does that what mean? What does it mean exactly? Right. What does, did I just does move? that does that mean that I disconnect and right, reconnect? Right. I mean, yeah. what happened here? And 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 so, there and, limits. and, and yeah. weirdly enough, I reviewed a paper in 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 the two thousands uh, that was actually proposing putting networking in a namespace and proposing that exact same thing that that if you move dev TCP something to dev TCP something else, it would disconnect and reconnect. It was just you know it's just fairly awful. So, and and so. Plan 9 kind of worked really hard. And in the 90s, I think they got all the abstractions right for sort of the namespace model of all these resources like your networking stack, like your, you know, your process control and all that. But of course, by that time, it almost didn't matter because Unix, you know, had owned the world at that point. Right. And, and, and basically, AT&T kept fouling up the release of Plan 9. Uh, we finally got it right in 2013, and by then nobody really cared. But we did get it out <laughs> under GPL, but it took like 25 years, you know. And um, funny side story to that, and I can tell this tale out of school because literally most of the people involved are no longer alive. But 
when they were talking in at t about releasing Plan 9, one of the people no longer alive told me, look, the reason we didn't release it the way we released Unix is that people at the company at the time were saying, well, look what happened when we released Unix. We don't want to do that again. Meaning from their point of view, right, they lost they'd control. Lost control. Right. And, and, and they didn't kind of see that you lost control, <laughs> but you set the standard for like the ages. Right. Didn't matter. And so, if you had not done that for Unix... Unix likely would have died on the vine had it not been for Lions and the. the I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I don't see how if Unix had been locked up inside of AT and I don't know what would be running today. I don't know what would be running today, but yeah. it, it would be in the confines of interesting systems that no one runs. Yeah, the abstractions flourished because they were made available. But and, and in fact, in the late seventies, there was a lot of discussion that our future looked like an IBM mainframe, right? Because there were plug compatibles, and IBM was everywhere, and we just said, uh, "Yeah, fine, we're, we'd better accept that the future is going to look like uh, an IBM mainframe." And then I don't know, a lot of people don't remember this, but uh, around 1998, DARPA announced they would only fund Windows NT efforts. Or you were there for that, no, right? No, I was going to say thank you for mentioning that because when you mentioned the mainframe, because that's when I came up yeah. in the in the mid-90s and I just, I graduated in 96 and decided that I want to do OS development. Yeah. And I was told explicitly that the world is going to Windows. Right. So there is only, and I have to remind people of this, that the reason I went to Sun Microsystems in 1996 is because Sun was the only computer company that believed in Unix. Yeah. This is True. before Linux, really. Linux, yes, it existed in 92. But like in 1996, Linux isn't really a thing. Right. Unix itself is now viewed because of, of these complicated monoliths that it's become. It is Unix is dying of its own weight. Yeah. And everyone yeah. is mortgaging their future to Windows. But it's interesting to think of that. That looked a lot like the IBM mainframe from the late 70s. Everyone, yeah. It should be a mainframe. And I feel it's the same way today with AWS, honestly, where it's like everything should just be on AWS because it's like, you know, or you, we see this again and again in tech. Yeah, where it happens again and again. And, and, and the thing that eventually wins, I, and I almost for a while had decided I was going to be wrong about firmware, and I'm still not sure I'm going to be right, but the thing that's open source tends to win. Yes. And I don't know what that means for the world we're in today, but there really was a period of time. I remember at Los Alamos in 2001, a physicist said to me, well, it's all well and good to be playing games with this Linux toy, but we've got serious work to do here and we're doing it on Unix, right? And, <laughs> and less than two years later, all the major computing infrastructure was Linux-based. Right. So it, it happened like literally while people were had their backs turned almost. Well, and I think that people didn't appreciate that what was actually happening is x86 was passing all of the risk vendors. Yes. Nobody, Nobody expected that. No. I mean, right. making ASCII ad before multiply operate at, you know, multiple gigahertz. Never yeah. We never thought we'd see that. No, nobody. And and you have to hand it to Intel. Oh that's my a, gosh, That's yes. an incredible accomplishment. And, you know, we, we in, the, in the 90s, you know, for a while, right, PowerPC had the higher clock rate and Alpha had the amazing high clock rate. And we all looked at the x86 and said, they're never going to get here. And we turned our back and turned around, and all of a sudden, it just blew right by everybody. It was and, amazing. And so, you, and you were on the front lines of that happening, really, because you, you guys are very performance sensitive, clearly. At, yep. And you're going to, whatever is going to be higher performing, you're going to use. Yep. And that was becoming x86. Well, interesting story about that. So, we had, we had built a cluster at Los Alamos called Q. Uh, we ended up spending $100 million, $120 million to get 20 teraflops, which is nothing now. It was a big deal back then. About the same year that was being delivered, we built an x86 Linux BIOS cluster that for $6 million was 10 teraflops. Wow. So we essentially showed a few things. First is we were about a tenth of price. We were the same performance. The big machine with the alphas... Basically, the plan, the rule at the time was uh, 100% uptime means that you're up maybe all of a week, but for a couple hours while we do plan maintenance. <laughs> so the the system we built, which we called Pink, because there was ASCII blue, red, and white and all this stuff, and we said, no, we're going to call it Pink. That caused a lot of upset, <laughs> I got to tell you, which is why we did it. Um, but that basically was up continuously. So it had 110 or 20% uptime. Right, so so nobody was expecting that, but you know, the nodes were Linux BIOS nodes. They had no local disk. They were just just far, far, far more reliable than the big expensive machines. 
So the lesson learned there is, you know, the joke, a friend of mine used to make a joke about, you know, you could buy a, a smaller disc than this big Cray disc that we used to get, but you'd have to spend a lot less money. So we would say, you know, you know, you could buy a much better cluster than that thing, but you'll have to spend one-tenth the money. I hope that's okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know what? It actually isn't sometimes. It sometimes it's not, especially with, I mean, someone who has spent, a, you know, $100 million of the taxpayer's money on, on yep. that, that's, you're not it, exactly it, making them look great. We weren't making friends. So, so being in the 90s, when I really first got started in a cluster game, I went up to, uh, let's call it the nameless government agency and, and said, you know, about 95% of the cycles on your big vector Cray machines are not vector cycles, they're scalar cycles. And I can give you machines for literally a hundred times less money that will run just as fast based on commodity workstations. Isn't this cool? And I realized after I gave the talk that I, they were really angry with me and I thought, why are they so angry with me? I'm going to save them a lot of money. And then I realized, yes, that's a bad thing to do in the government right. because that means that guy's budget just got smaller. And it also means the fraction of budget that is represented by people just got a lot bigger because I've reduced his hardware cost and further the 95% of the people running scalar cycles in a vector machine are paying the rent. And the 5% of those people can't pay the rent. Right. And so that was basically the dagger into the heart of the big vector machines was, you know, started in the early nineties when, you know, not just me, but we started showing that we could take a bunch of rack them, stack them, spend 40 grand, literally 40 grand on my first cluster and outrun for for many important apps, we just outran the Cray easily. For for apps that you would think would be vector, would they be, were these weren't vector apps. That was the all whole, scalar yeah, apps. Yeah, yeah, these were scalar apps, and we just left that thing in the dust. Right. And 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 so the same thing happened with the x eighty six. Right, people were spending hundreds of millions of dollars on on what essentially were commodity clusters, and we showed that well, if you want to you know do a commodity, get this cheap PC, and by the way. We are not sensitive to cosmic rays at 7,200 feet the way the alphas were. So you'll actually get a more reliable machine because you won't have single bit upsets in your L2 cache. So we spent less money and got a better machine, which was, again, not a, not a popular message. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be right back with more Ron Minnick and his Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. On the Metal is brought to you by the Oxide Computer Company. Well, bad news. I just got back from a meeting with the attorneys. Oh, boy. They are not going to let us say much in these ads. We can't talk about the customer experience today for on-premises infrastructure. So we can't do my idea to be like, are you being gaslit by your vendors? Because that's what they're doing. They are gaslighting people into thinking that these bugs only exist on one of their machines when it exists on like everyone's. God, no. They called that, I think, quote, a third rail. They must be following Jess on Twitter. I knew that that was a bad idea to let the lawyers follow Jess on Twitter. <laughs> uh, they also said we can't talk about public cloud customer experience. Oh, come on. We can't talk about the rapacious bandwidth pricing? I mean, it's practically criminal. No, can't talk about the unit economics of that at Can all. we use the word criminal with respect to public cloud vendors? Definitely not. Oh, boy. What can we do? Well, they did say they gave us a statement we can use, which is... Are you going to read from it? Oxide Computer Company is building something that should help some people. Well, that seems very direct. Come on. Can we at least send them over to Oxide.Computer? We can. We can. The other bit of bad news is all the lawyers were there in the meeting. Oh, wait a minute. Not just the cheap one, but the expensive one? Yeah, they were all there. So we paid a fortune to get this terrible ad. Oh my God, please, listener, go to Oxide.Computer and learn what we're actually doing. All right, we're back. So, Ron, you've just built Pink. Yeah, this cluster, which is so good, it's profoundly unpopular because <laughs> yes. it's, 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 a, it's a dangerous cluster well, because it is... Uh, so there are other ways that we, we cause trouble. So remember the VA Linux node, he took five minutes to boot. So we put software on there that was written by Eric Hendricks, who's a really neat guy. He's at Google now. It was called VProc. And the way VProc worked, um, we had a kernel and a daemon in Flash. And then, you know, it VProc... You'd have a thousand nodes, thousand twenty-three to be honest, with one node at head end, and these nodes would come up, and they would all zero in on the home node and say, "I want to boot." And what Eric implemented was this ad hoc tree 
the first 32 nodes in hmm. would be, it was like the Godfather, right? Right. I'm going to ask you for a favor. Or maybe it's like Trump. I don't know. So <laughs> so the first 32 nodes in would be said, here's the image. And by the way, I want you to hang around a while because I'm going to come back and very quickly and ask you to boot other nodes. Interesting. So now our boot scenario is 32 nodes boot and they boot 32 more each and now you're up. So you're gossiping boot images. Yes. That's cool. And, That's and great. It was a beautiful thing. And and Eric did the experiment with do we do this IP multicast or point to point? Turned out point to point always won. That's interesting. interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. It was not a static layout. It was whoever got in the first 32 first, they were assigned. Right. All that code's available, by the way. It's on GitHub. Yeah. Oh, cool. And we've been wanting to rewrite it in Go because um, it's so cool. Yeah. Trivially easy in Go with Go routines and channels. So we booted, right? We booted in a minute and a half. And right. and most of that minute and a half was, I'm sorry, two and a half minutes. Most of that time actually was spent, MirrorNet was source routed and you didn't know the routes. And so so the the MirrorNet, the Miracom thing that that mapped the network took four hours to run. So again, I, Eric is like, Eric Hendricks is one of my like, man, that guy's smart type guys, right? He wrote his own MirrorNet configurator that would actually map the whole thing in seven seconds oh wow and and so okay now we're booting in two and a half minutes where's a lot of that time spent it's actually spent printing serial messages because you always want those messages now we're up now all these nodes are going to go to the high performance cluster file system we bought from a company i won't name that said it was super scalable and they please never don't, please don't be sun please don't be sun please don't be sun no no it's not sun <laughs> they they had never been able to test what happened when 1023 nodes came at their system simultaneously and said we're ready to mount now right you yeah. know what happened oh the software falls over yeah yeah you know what got blamed Oh, the, the, uh, the speed of the boot, yeah, of course. We got blamed. Yeah. It's, <laughs> a, it's, yeah, it's you, a bug you, in your system. You're right. So, and, uh, and, and they didn't even say it's because you're booting so fast. They said it's a bug in your system. That's right. crazy. And so, you know, we had to walk through. And in the end, the really weird thing that came out of this is uh, I was talking to somebody from Los Alamos a while ago, and they said, they said there's still some bad memories about Linux BIOS and VPROC. Because of problems they caused. And I thought, well, what was that? Well, it was too fast. It was too fast, right? And Still some, some bad blood over the high and, performance. And then further, Eric implemented a scheduler that really really took advantage of his VPROC ideas. And he could start a 16 megabyte MPI image in about eh, one to two seconds, call it, which was only about 60 times faster than anything else. And that used the same kind of ad hoc tree for distributing the binary. Yeah, interesting. So... It's still the best cluster system I've ever used, bar none, because the way his model worked is you would start the process up on the head node and then migrate it, but it would leave a slot, a zombie process slot. And when you type PS, you saw all your processes on the cluster at the head node. Right. It was a very, very nice model, but further, he, he, he again, he would start his MPI job so quickly, they would all go to the quote unquote scalable storage system and crash it. And crash it. Right. So, so oh, again, oh Eric, you've you've done something terrible. Well, no, the terrible thing you did is you're fast. <laughs> and so I, I Jess, there's no way you know about Miranet, I would assume. No, yeah, no. yeah. Show, no. Mirrored, yeah, Miranet is one of those things that's kind of lost to history. It was obviously big in HPC, but it was Yeah. It, it was it was it was actually Chuck Seitz developed it at Caltech. And it, you know in the night, I, I first saw a talk on it, I guess, in 1996, maybe. And um, it was really kind of cool because it was so damn cheap. But it was a two gigabit network when that was like 20 times faster than anything good, anybody good else had. Yeah. yeah, Super low latency port to port. It had a lot of really neat ideas. All fiber, right? All fiber. Well, actually, it was cable. It actually was copper. Was it and copper? And the copper was the size of your index finger, the connector. It oh, was wow. Just okay. insanely it was, copper. It, wow, okay. I thought it was fiber. Interesting. All right. And it had these little neat little routers. And the only the only gotcha with the whole thing was the fact that it was a source-routed network. And that meant you had to sort of, in parallel, everybody had to figure out, well, what's the topology of my network? And then store it as a source route. And, and, and the way it worked is every switch you went through, it would rip off the first end bits of your packet and say, ah, now I know your output port. And then, you know, your now shorter packet would go to the next hop. It was really cool, right? That's but cool. And simple. I mean, I remember the thing I was always impressed by is the performance was so much better than Ethernet at the time. Yeah. And then you look at the card and you're like, where is it? I mean, there's just like the card was very lean. Just yes, probably, it, it, it really was. There was not a lot on there. You're just like, wow. And, okay. And Why did it die? 
Yeah, that's the- um because it. I mean, ah, uh, you know why I died? Well, it was up against Ethernet. I mean, it was up against commodity Ethernet. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It was kind of up against Infiniman, the IB two for a yeah. while, and it and it and, and to be honest, Infiniman just had. I think more money and, and in the end, better performance Yeah, in the end, at least for what people wanted. Now there's a guy named Patrick Joffre, now at Google who worked at Miracom, very, very smart guy who did a lot of really, really nice work in the early two thousands. And among other things showing that you don't always need OS bypass, hmm. um, really shaped a lot of my thinking, hmm. but anyway, everybody does OS bypass anyway, but arguably for Serum HPC applications, Sandia actually showed that, Miracom would outrun InfiniBand, but it really didn't matter because the theory was InfiniBand was going to be the Ethernet of HPC. There'd right. be all these vendors selling InfiniBand. In the end, there was only one, but right. there were going to be all these vendors selling InfiniBand cards, and you know we'd all be happy with our Ethernet of HPC. Well, it turns out the Ethernet of HPC is probably Ethernet because yeah. they all became Ethernet. Like yeah. if you looked, Miracom at some point said, "Oh, by the way, our our, our interfaces do you know Ethernet." And then Mellanox, after a while, said, oh, by the way, our interface is to Ethernet, too. And, and you really look, everybody just converts on Ethernet. Well, and you, even with Mellanox today, it's very hard for the, get them to confess that, like, your Ethernet is actually, this is IB. Like, you actually, you've got, there's an there's IB at the brainstem of a Mellanox card. Yeah, well, it, and I don't know if this is true, but I know, you know, a while back, it was the case that the Phi for all these networks was the same Phi. That's right, yeah. It was an and it was IB all Phi. licensed, it was all licensed from Dolphin. Of all places. Right. Wow. And, and, you know, the weirdest thing, I mean, Dolphin really knows how to do these FIs and they had a FI for their shared memory network. But in the end, you know, everybody licensed their FI. Huh. And I was told that was a, a, a big good thing for them because people were actually, their network was really cool, but not as many people bought that as bought their FI. Huh. So... Interesting. Yeah. And then IB, of course, was itself. Talk about, I mean, you're talking about the the complexity versus simplicity. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, we used to joke that the only reason that, that it was the national labs buying IB because they had the indentured servants in, in the form of postdocs to actually go configure the thing. I mean, yes, was, true. So we we actually, so one of the Linux BIOS clusters we built in the early 2000s at Atlantal was the first Opteron cluster uh, running Linux BIOS as well. And it had IB. And you may remember back then there was the Intel uh, IBAL. Right. And then there was the other one, which I've forgotten the acronym for. And as delivered, that system used IBAL to bring the network up and then it used the other one to actually do comps. <laughs> it was just the worst of all worlds. Worst thing ever. And at some point, it, it was, I can't describe how much pain that InfiniMan thing was. And, you know, we had people walking through the spec and realizing at some point, Spec and code were going to be really, really an effort to deal with. And uh, at, at some point, what happened, and I, I really regret, I can't get his name in my head right now. We had these two enormous stacks of code. <laughs> and we had a guy from, uh, well, I'll just say at Intel, because you can find a discussion who said, we've got this really cool patch, the Linux kernel that will give you IB, and it's only 280,000 lines or something like that. And we just kind of said, that is a non-starter. <laughs> right. right? This is just not going to happen. Oh, my gosh. But one engineer, and and again, I've known him forever, and I'm just blanking on his name, just came up and very quietly said, I'm starting from scratch. Here's my driver. It's really compact. I'm not really drawing on a lot of this other source code. And that is what eventually became sort of the, the kernel subsystem. Somebody just said, I realize there's millions of dollars placed in these other two gigantic stacks that are mutually but incompatible, but this isn't going to work. Yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> and and it just, yeah, it's just an example again of sometimes a code base can be so large, it might as well be a binary blob. Oh my God, right. And so sometimes you just say, shove it off the table and start clean. Well, it's like the, the, the Broadcom SDK for the top of rack silicon. Mm-hmm. I, someone had told me that it's 14 million lines of code. Wow. And I went to Robert Mustaki, who's a, now an oxide engineer. And I'm like, Robert, 14 million. He's like, he's like, I don't know about that. That seems a little light. Let me count it. Yeah, the Broadcom SDK. It seems a little light. It seems light. Okay. And it was light. It's more than 14 million. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, you're just, and you just have the same thing of like, how? I mean, how do we have this much complexity 
to enable silicon. And you know, some of it's for good reason, but a lot of it's not. A lot of it is just this accretion. And, and then people yeah. don't go back to first principles and say like, okay, let's actually write this. And this is what I so love about the open firmware movement about like, okay, what do we actually need here? Let's actually start over from scratch and let's build the stuff that we need as opposed to the stuff that we have along for the ride for a multi-decade long ride. Yeah. I, well, actually, I propose that. It, so we may not always be happy with what an individual company is doing, but we need to not forget there are really good people at those companies. So just this morning, got a note. Intel has released firmware for the management engine called Ignition Firmware. Yes. 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 Half a megabyte. Cool. Yes. Well, what's really cool is who really spearheaded getting this done? Well, it was four engineers from Intel. Yeah. That's who, amazing. Yeah. And and they're great guys. You can find the note. But, you know, we need to we need to remember that there's some just there are really some terrific people at these companies who really are trying to do, you know, the best thing they can. So I so. confess, uh, Jess and I have already read the note, as have all of our engineers. That note, the note this morning about the ignition firmware, yeah. that got around the internet. very. Cause for the folks that have been watching this space closely, yeah. where the ME has been so tightly held, to get anything that is redistributable, that is smaller. Yeah. That it's like, boy, uh, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Thing. And it shows that the, you know, the, the companies can change and you've got, especially you've got engineers boots on ground that are trying to make the right thing happen. And so, yeah, you know, it's a big step forward. And, I would love to hear the organizational kind of battle that they had to get into about that. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I, the main thing I know is boy, they, they, they fought the good fight and yeah. they did, you know, it may be, cause I felt, and I don't know if you felt this way, I felt this way for years where you would speak with Intel in particular about firmware in particular, yeah. where you are, it's like, why does American Megatrends still exist as a company? Why, you know, this is from my childhood. Why are we, why is this at the brainstem of humanity? And, you know, you would ask Intel about open firmware. We were asking uh, as a customer of Intel, asking yeah. about open firmware. Every meeting we would ask about open firmware. And every meeting you basically get the same response, which is people around the table more or less agreeing with you. Yeah. Of like, yes, yeah. I, like what you're saying is right. You're right. You're right. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. But yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's just not a decision we're making. And, we, you know, we, the Intel folks that you're dealing with, we had great Intel folks that we were dealing with, yeah. but they did not feel empowered. And they weren't empowered. I mean, they didn't feel empowered for a very good reason because they were not empowered. And I think that when, you know, that, I, I've got a question for you, Ron. Because I, just one quick thing. Yeah. Again, before we beat up on AMI too much, right? I mean, I admit that, you know, again, in my past, it wasn't something I needed, but they, they do provide a thing that people need. So, you know. I just would, it, I, I want it not to be a proprietary blob. I I, I want it like open source it and, yeah. and, and and let's find another revenue model for you. But that's what I, that, that, that's no, I th I'd what be, I take issue with. I think everybody would be happier, especially in light of all the security issues that have popped up in the last just five years, if all that stack were open source. So because here's my question. what do you trust? Apropos you know, of that. Yeah. I feel that Spectre and Meltdown have helped to accelerate open firmware at Intel. I feel that Spectre and Meltdown, yeah. I, it'd be interesting to know your read on this, but my read on this is that I saw a real change in Intel after Spectre and Meltdown where they, they realized that they had totally screwed up. And they were very accepting of that actually. And I saw their behavior change mm. around security, around vulnerabilities. And that's when I we began to see the first cracks. I began to see the first cracks anyway. Maybe you saw the first cracks earlier with respect to accepting open firmware? I, I'm not sure. On, so I, I was not uh, directly involved with any of that. The, the thing I'm seeing is more, so so I, I started showing people what could be done in by way of bad things in firmware about 20 years ago. Oh, interesting. Wow. And the general response- What, what I, were you showing them 20 years ago? I mean, I, I, I can only imagine. Oh, it was a joke. I did this thing as a joke. I, 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 I turned a machine on and I ran a program that put, the string, this is a secret message in Flash, and then turned it off and turned it on and said, look, see, it's still there. And I pointed out, you know, there are organizations in this world that switch machines between different security levels. And I said, yeah. here's how you get bad things out. And the general response from everybody was, well, let's not talk about that. And it won't happen <laughs> under Windows anyway. You can't do that under Windows if you have the right service packs and all this nonsense. So 
So I've been trying to get this out for a long time, but I think that- um, <laughs> You can't do it under Windows. But, uh, serious, that I mean, was the response. It's like, I have physical possession of the machine. Like, right. I, I can I can do what I want. <laughs> right, but, but again, it's just, you, you know, the sort of idea that the, all the file spenders tried to push is, our code's perfect, this stuff won't happen, don't worry about it. Now, I see two things that really have pushed this along. One, maybe my bias here, Chromebooks have really pushed hmm. yeah. the idea that actually Core Boot can work for real computers. Yeah, And I'm hearing more and more about Core Boot now and laptops. And of course, System76 got to really give them a, a nod. Uh, totally. Fantastic. Yep. yep. And I know they get a lot of crap, but Purism, be honest, did also push on the idea of Core Boot. They're not as you know visible at the moment, but System76 actually a few weeks ago pushed commits um, for management engine blobs for their laptops. That's correct. And nice. just for the broader audience, who's System76? System76. Laptops. Uh, laptops. We were going to, you know, Jess and I were going to uh, get you to get a System76 laptop. Get right? a Dart, yeah, look at the Darter Pro. I mean, I, it's They're nice. really nice. They have They're 4K nice. ones. The 4K one is a bit bulky, uh, but like, I like it. And they are unique because... They, they are, do open firmware. Open firmware. So a Linux laptop, um, they actually have their own OS as well, but uh, it's all open firmware. So the, they are not trying to be, and, and but it's price competitive and it is feature competitive with other laptops. So it, it shows yeah. that it's, like, it's economically possible. I mean, they're a kindred spirit. And it will allow me to tinker with my laptop more. Totally. Well, and it will allow you to get at, at a say this kind of like getting, and I don't think they're quite at the Chromebook level. I mean, Chromebook really is amazing in terms of, of its ability. to They're do quite it. incredible. Yeah. So let me, I, yeah. I, I'm going to run into that. So system 76, what I like about them is they started from a point of let's do the right thing. Okay. We're going to build open systems and they're going to run core boot. We're going to figure out how to make that work. And they followed the same path that everybody has to follow you're going to get something designed by someone else and you're going to kind of make it work for your needs. And and what the folks there I talked to have said is in a lot of ways that the newest ones are the ones where they really had a huge amount of, of, of impact on the design of, and I think it, it they're just nice units. Hmm. Um, they feel nice, you know, when you hold them, that kind of thing. But further, I can get clone to corporate repo. I can build a firmware image for a system 76. I can burn it on that machine. So if I'm in a company where I don't want to believe what I, you know, what might be in, in the firmware, I can just burn it again. So this is really interesting to, I think, anybody who realizes how bad the attacks you can put in firmware are. So System76, what's really cool about them too is you got a lot of configurability in terms of how much memory, how much NVMe, that kind of thing, and what distro you run. So Chromebooks have absolutely, in my opinion, and I've worked with them for a long time now, I've completely and utterly nailed building a thing that when it turns on and puts up a screen that doesn't have a warning on it, I can believe it's running the right software, right? Yeah, yeah um, they really have. And further, Chromebooks have nailed the, oh, by the way, uh, you know, hold down this magic key combo and it's yours. It's your laptop now. Now, we will put up a crazy warning screen, but then we'll boot to whatever you want to boot to. The deep, dark secret that nobody knows about Chromebooks, and I've been trying to give talks about this for years, but people still don't know it is, you can further take that Chromebook, rekey it with your personal key, and build an operating system image, which you sign with your personal key, and that Chromebook from then on will only boot your version of your operating system that you load. That's it cool. won't even recognize Google's operating system as legitimate. This is This is the... This fantastic property of Chromebooks, which I've been I I've been trying to kind of make <laughs> noise about for years, yeah. but but I think the system. Well, if there's, if there's no way back, that may be by the reason that people are you, you always worry about. No, there like, is there is no way back when you blow right. those those and you blow those Google keys out of your Chromebook, right? You're running your version of Chrome OS right. or whatever forever. But but I think that I kind of feel maybe the system seventy six will 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 maybe take a little attention from that anyway, just because it's so, so incredibly configurable. And I, right. you know, maybe uh, we'll see, I don't, I don't have any knowledge at all, but it, about this. So I'm just going to say hypothetically, but it'd be, you know, maybe down the road, we see system 76 picking up those additional properties of Chromebooks that make them so incredibly uh, trustworthy. But, you, you know, in my view, and if you kind of look like I worked with some of the early Chromebooks in, in a day, some of them at least were sort of, Here's a laptop we already sell. 
We're going to change that motherboard so it can be a Chromebook. But if you look at them today, Chromebooks are just so incredibly nice. You know, they have a nice feel. And, you know, okay, I'm biased. I work at Google, but I don't work in Chromebook land anymore. And I just think the hardware is just really, really sweet. No, so, I'm a huge fan of the Chromebooks. Like, I I, uh, I tracked that since, like, 2014. And then when I realized that it was open source and I could build Chrome OS myself, then I was like, oh, also, it's Gen 2, and I can make, like, my own distro based off of it. <laughs> but the experience with Chrome OS is also so good that it's like, why even do that, honestly? Especially with the virtualization now. People yeah, yeah. really love it. The, the only thing that, the only reason I don't own a Chromebook today for my work is I miss the ability to, throwing a lot of memory in NVMe. So in 2012, I had a Chromebook that had 16 gig of RAM and 320 gig of, of you know, uh, uh, flash SSD. That and, was a real laptop in 2012. You, you, yeah, that was a the, really the, the, big the, thing, yeah, right? That, that's I mean, a, that's it, a fire breather. It literally took about 20 seconds to bring the memory up because it was right. just, right? And But I can't do that today. I wish I could. Yeah. On a, but, I, I, the, you know, for lots of good reasons, they're not, Things you pull, you rip open and throw in your own RAM and disk, but you don't. And, and as in my my only, I love the Chromebooks. The kids all have the Chromebooks. That's, that, mm -hmm. Those are their computers. Yeah, um, and they, in the school, they get they all get the Chromebooks, and they're so good. I I almost I worry that they discourage that kind of experimentation because there are so many conditions. Yeah. Under, which is like, well, now this is not going to boot, um, <laughs> and for good reason. But the, the, so my I guess my my only criticism is that they're so good at what they do. But I yeah. but but I do like the ability to actually go install your own thing it's like it, it does not deprive you of the ownership of your computer in, in fact um we've had two sets of interns do two different operating systems for chromebooks that aren't chrome os as projects one is called nichrome os which is kind of con dormant but nichrome os was based on uroot so all the code was go the window manager was written in go and in the manner of uroot um once you really started booting everything got compiled on first use. So oh, wow. that meant the window manager source was there for you to see. Now, obviously the web browser source wasn't there because it was Chrome, but, and then the most recent one is called web boot. And, and that will be a system which we demonstrated for a few, well, really one distro Chromebook boots and says, what distro do you want to run? And you might say, I don't know, tiny core. And it knows how to go get tiny core, pull it all down, pull down a live image, keg second, and now you're running tiny core. So, so this would be sort of, the ultimate stateless device because you know it when it boots it asks you what distro to run and and the plan is and just you know again this is all intern project all open source nothing to do with google right it's just that this is a good thing for interns to learn how to do systems um you might not have a system with no disk in it right and why would you ever do that well suppose you 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 live oh, in a place yeah. where you don't want a disk right, right? yeah there's you, yeah there are reasons to do it i mean yeah if, just as there are reasons to have stateless services, there are definitely right. reasons to have a stateless laptop. There's a so, lot to be said for that. So I think you could potentially build Joanna Rakowska's um, Tails machine based on the Chromebook and Webboot. It wouldn't be quite her machine, but you know, we like the idea that you can sort of pick your distro boot by boot. There's no state. You turn it off and everything's gone. Right. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you got to imagine that that there are a lot of three letter agencies that would love to have the, to know that you're entirely stateless on the laptop. Yeah. Well, actually, the the one one app that I sort of in, partly inspired my interest in it is the the case of the journalist, right? Who's in a hotel room or yeah. whoever, and they're about to get arrested, and you know, turn off the Chromebook or the web boot device, and uh, you it's know, gone. everything's gone. And, yeah. And so. There are a lot of cases where a stateless device or, or um, potentially, uh, you know, go beyond just the government agency scenarios. Yeah, that's that's great. All right, we're going to take another break. We will be back with more on the metal with Ron Minnick. On the Metal is brought to you by the Oxide Computer Company, where we're going to try a new feature shamelessly ripped off of Reply All's Yes, Yes, No, where our boss, Steve Tuck, brings us a tweet we, he does not understand, and Jess and I try to explain it to him. Steve, do you have a tweet? I sure do. Go the for it. The tweet in question, UEFI preboot network stack engaged the onboard NIC in such a way that it would write back DMA to particular physical memory pages sometime after control was passed to the bootloader. Corruption would occur somewhere in the user parts of the RAM disk. No idea. No idea. Jess, do you understand this tweet? So I understand definitely the part about the UEFI preboot networking stack, but 
the part about DMA is in question marks. So it's like, I guess you're not really sure where that's you're going. You're overthinking it. I understand this tweet. Running on-prem is painful. This is dealing with an <laughs> awful, awful firmware bug. The firmware has overwritten part of the operating system in a way that is extremely painful to debug. So who do you go to in that case? Who do you go to? You definitely strangle one of your vendors. You strangle one of your vendors. And unfortunately, your vendor is a PC vendor because all of the existing <laughs> computer companies are selling personal computers. What we need is a new computer company. So this is just saying I'm in intense pain trying to run systems on premises. That's exactly what it's saying. Steve, what can someone do if they're in intense pain running on premises? Well, if someone is running in intense pain on premises, what they should do is go over to oxide.computer to learn a little bit more about how we are going to take that pain away. Help is on the way. Join us at oxide.computer. You are not alone. All right, we're back. So, Ron, we, we were just singing the high praises of the Chromebook and, and Core Boot and, and then System76 and what they've done with Core Boot. Where are you seeing open firmware? Um, I mean, obviously, you're in the Oxide garage, so we're very interested in the server space. Where are you seeing it in the, in the server space? Are you seeing, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of interest in it. This is a good question because your timing's perfect. And in fact, especially with the Intel announcement this morning, so... I'm on the, I'm on one of the, it's a very strange name. I'm on the incubation committee at Open Compute Platform, which means we evaluate new standards coming in and say yes or no, whether they become an OCP thing. I was formerly the project leader at the Open System Firmware Project, which became officially a project in August of OCP. Right. What that project says is that, I'll give the end state first. March 2021, if your OCP server wants to have OCP accepted branding, it must be possible to purchase an OCP server running open system firmware. And further, it must be possible for the customer to replace that with their own build of open system firmware without asking the ODM for permission or asking the ODM to sign it. And further, it must be possible for you to give that build to someone else or give that system to someone else and they can build and install their own. That is actually not possible today. Everybody right. thinks I, it I, is. I don't think, yeah, well, yeah and, that's and, not possible by a long shot, right? Yeah, I mean, now, now. The, virtually none of those things is possible. I've been actually talking to people about this. There's this really weird thing coming down the pike at us. If I buy a 2012 Facebook server from IT Renew, I can do this. I can I can build an open system firmware image. The ones we build are always based on Linux boot and your root doesn't matter. I can burn it, it'll work. Unfortunately, this has led people to believe that this will always work. Mm -hmm. But for example, if you buy a Dell server today or an HPE server or whatever, and you change one bit of the firmware, in the case of the Dell, it'll say something horrible has happened. You've, you know, something's happened to my firmware and and it Okay, it's kind of nice to have this recovery path. The, the BMC will rewrite the firmware and your changes are erased. And what's happening is coming kind of in this used machine pipeline at companies like IT Renew are servers where they can't replace the firmware. And our goal is to make that period of time, you know, you think of a pipeline and you think of big, almost like this pipeline of oil and there's some bad oil in the pipeline, Right. We're trying to make the period of time where those servers can't have their firmware replaced as short as possible. But we're already kind of behind it because probably starting in the 2017 or 2016 years and maybe earlier, there are servers that have this thing called boot guard and boot guard right. is what locks you in. How does boot guard lock you in? There are one-time fuses in, in, in what's called the peripheral controller hub, which is a chip. When you blow those fuses, that locks in the key and the only firmware that can run on the machine is, is firmware signed with the key. Right. So you get a machine, you're not going to update the BIOS, period. And and our our world, the world we all live in, the, the, the kind of the nerd world, let's just call it, <laughs> nobody really realizes this, right? People, right. I talk to people and, and, and they say, what do you mean I can't load my own firmware? I, I know how to burn a flash part. And I say, yeah, but you don't have the key to sign that part. Right. And you are locked in. And the actual and, CPU is not going to execute. The CPU is not going to execute instruction. I mean, the, yeah. it, it, this is an it, Intel it, construct, right? Yeah, the model is, uh, we call the model brick, not boot, right? <laughs> right. And and the goal with open system firmware, one of our goals is boot, not brick. 
That's kind of the Chromebook model, actually. Chromebook right. will always boot. It won't. It, it, I bricked a Chromebook. It took a lot of work, and and I did things that people don't generally do. And it's only one of the ones I ever worked with in in eight years. But the model that comes with Bootcard is you're going to brick if anything looks even a little bit off, and that that's the model we we've gotten acceptance from a lot of OCP vendors, and we've gotten support from Intel on this actually that we want to be able to ship systems. With their, where the user is in control of the firmware. Right. And you can and, you can know who's attested to the firmware mm-hmm. and you should be able to know and you should have a chain of trust and you should be able to know whether you that firmware is from a, a trusted source or not. But yeah, the that, idea that you can't boot. And the idea of boot not brick too is that, look, suppose I have a machine and it, and it boots and it can't attest for some reason. It'll, it'll contact the thing and the thing will say, ooh, you, you're bad. You go talk to that other thing that will figure out what's wrong with you, but it won't be completely dead. Right. Which is, you know, the current model is, is things that die. Now, fact is there are a lot of companies that are perfectly happy with brick, not boot. So we're not saying you can't sell it at all. What we are saying is it has to be possible to buy a machine that follows this boot, not brick user owned firmware model. The fuses aren't blown. The fu- we would prefer the fuses not exist. Right. right? One time fuses like that, that's it's, a problem. It's right? a problem. And especially when there are, then it's especially gutting when there are vulnerabilities found in the mechanism itself. Yep. Where it turns out it doesn't even work. I mean, right. the, the, you can like, so the bad guys can find a way around it. It's like, so this well, is just punishing folks. This, I've heard a lot of stories about, you know, organized crime and, and, and this kind of vulnerability. I've heard, I've been told that, the way it was told to me by a faculty member from ETH is you, you, if you've seen Narcos, uh, you might go somewhere now and you look at this big old barn and you think, oh, there's, there's a drug manufacturing facility in the barn. And he said, no, you go in and you're going to find four E-beam and they do decapping and they can find vulnerabilities in chips. That's the big money thing. Right. right. And that, that just, just knocked me on my heels. I didn't, I didn't even, he had to explain to me what he was talking about at first because I thought, what are you, what do you mean? But uh, there's a lot of money in in decapping and, and working out what's in a chip and finding these vulnerabilities. And so the two arguments I kind of make for this is, first off, there are a lot of really smart people at a company like Intel or AMD or ARM, whatever, huge numbers of really smart people trying to solve these problems. The problem is there are way more smart people out in the world, and they only got to succeed once, and they're in. Yeah. So right. um, we're trying to get to a world where, you know, Servers come with user-controlled ability to control to, to build and burn our own firmware. We can get much faster turnaround on vulnerabilities. Um, we're, we're all of us empowered to find vulnerabilities. We want the good guys looking for vulnerabilities, not just the bad guys. Right. And that can only happen if, if, if the firmware open. is open. Yep. And finally, we want a world where when, when we're done, when Facebook or whoever is done with a server, and Facebook is doing this already, actually, they can cart, you know, just put those servers on a cargo pallet and ship them to a company like IT Renew, and IT Renew refurbs them, and they sell them on to places that can't afford the new version of that, but it's still a really good machine. That's what IT Renew's been doing. So we want that to continue. It's called circular economy. It's a big thing in the world now, and I've been in on some of these meetings with various organizations, and my, you know, my, I feel like Cassandra sometimes just saying, you've got a problem with this model coming at you. Yes, we've been able to recycle 2012 servers, but we're going to have a big problem in about five years. We're going to get servers we can't rewrite the firmware on, and we are, to be honest, in, well, we're in a lot of trouble at that point. Right. So, So we're trying to, there's going to be a period of time where we're going to get these boot card enabled things and we can't do it, but we're hoping that post March, 2021, that won't be a problem. Now we have, I'm talking to companies today. March 2020 is an aspirational target, which means companies will optionally provide those. So you'll have a list in March 2020. There are companies that are going to come to the OCP summit. They're going to wave the flag and say, we will sell you a machine today with open system firmware. We're not required to, but we're ready to do it. And and to get back to the Intel ME firmware release of this morning, that is like the critical piece of all this. That's so, right. So right. Intel a year ago, you know, they they said they're going to help us. 
They put the FSP firmware support package blobs on GitHub along with their microcode. The license is a fantastic license, right? You can build that FSP blob into your firmware and you can redistribute it, knock yourself out. Right. And so not open source, but freely distributable. And right. you've got the binary. It's right. a binary blob, but it's a big step forward. It's something you can redistribute. And the last piece in the chain, and notice it wasn't for every chipset. doesn't matter. It's a start. It's for one chipset. The last piece in this chain has been the ME right. binary blob. What's I'm really delighted about is they not only released that blob, they released the ignition variant, right. yeah. which is just half a meg. Yeah, that is great. And I yeah. did not, I had not heard of that. It, is Ignition an internal Intel project? Yeah, I had not I've, heard of it until this morning. I've only just seen it in there in, in you know, Isaac, or I, it wasn't Isaac, it was another guy, but wrote it up and it, they explained what it was in that release and, and you'd have to read their thing. But I just read it enough to say, okay, Ignition, it's a half meg, great. And, you know, if it's a half meg as opposed to three meg, oh, it's, it's got to be doing a lot less stuff, right? It's got to be doing a lot less stuff. Right. I'm assuming <laughs> the web server's gone. <laughs> right. No, there's a lot so. of horrifying things there in, in the ME and in SMM too, right? In system management mode. I mean, that's the other, I know that's been something you've been working with the uh, Risk Five folks to make sure they don't repeat some of the same mistakes. Didn't work out. Um, but Really? <laughs> so it's, it yeah. Matter. We didn't work out yet. You know, I, I think you got to be an optimist given how much you've been able to, to triumph over. Um, yeah, we're, so let's see. Let me mention, uh, Intel has been proposing getting us out of the SMM box room with a new thing called PRM. We're talking, again, the, the person doing that, I wish I could not, I wish I weren't blanking on his name. I'm sorry, but he's, he's a real good guy and we're hoping to, be done with SMM here in the next little while. That'd be so that's great. That's cool. Yeah. You can look at, he's given I talks, I think, at OCP about it and it, and it looks good. That's good. And, and but, I mean, Jess, your paper on, I mean, you talked about SMM in your various ring paper. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what did you learn about it? I mean, for those folks who are learning about SMM, do you want to give them a, an explanation for? Yeah. Stands for system management mode. Ideally, like they wouldn't have shoved so many features in there but a lot of vendors tend to do that, it seems like. So uh, it becomes very bloated. And Steve, are you aware of this, is, this is like the, the yeah. Steve test. I am. All right, then we're, we're not going to talk about it. All right. It, no, I mean, not that Not that you're the... Actually, it, it's really interesting. If you think about PCs, um, all this stuff, SMM, yeah. all this stuff is an answer to the question, how do I keep supporting DOS 1.0? Yes. And, and, and so if I close the lid on a laptop and I want to do a sleep thing and DOS 1.0 doesn't know anything about sleep, how will I implement that? And that was, was the one answer. Of your talks where the SMM has uh, mouse drivers? Yes. It's a, uh, SMM has a uh, USB mouse, USB keyboard. It, it, you would you would really be amazed at, uh, at what all goes in there. It's terrifying. crazy. Yeah, it but, is but, terrifying. But again, that's why... In again, in the in the, like late '90s, I could get a laptop, I could run an operating system that didn't have USB support. I could plug in a USB mouse, and it would work. Right, SMM. So, you know, all this stuff arguably has a good has a good purpose, but 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 in the long run, Had. it's just it's just deadly. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Now, Especially now, in a data center, who needs uh, a mouse? Yes. Oh yeah. Well, and it's surface area. <laughs> honestly, you would not believe how many of these like recovery schemes for. Oh really. Server nodes involve a mouse. <laughs> actually, this upboard I have, which is teeny tiny ninety nine dollar board, um, I found out in the BIOS there is a graphics and mouse driver. And one of the things the mouse driver uses is it allows you, it gives you a little keyboard and you click buttons to. <laughs> oh my like, gosh! What is a mouse driver doing in this thing? Oh, <laughs> oh, it's for the keyboard. Oh, that makes sense. <sighs> and it's, it's a different keyboard. mouse driver than an SMM. It's a USB mouse driver. I mean, oh UFI God. mouse driver. So getting back, getting on to risk five. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that because I'm really glad you brought it up. So I've been a little bit disappointed lately to see, I guess I understand it, but to see kind of the UEFI port to RISC-V. Yeah. We did the core boot port in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. I got out of it at that point, but other people have done it in 2018 and 2019. And I I, I kind of... I've been told that the reason to do UEFI is because Linux wants it. That, that's the claim that's been made to me. That seems um, that seems crazy. That seems crazy, but right? It, that seems crazy. I mean, given that, like, it, that seems 
wait a minute. That seems no, no. I like that I, seems wrong. I, I am, but like, <laughs> like it just seems like it just like perverse. U, Linux hated UEFI as much as every other non Windows system. I know, hated but it. well, but Linux is pretty corporate now, right? And and it's and, like and Linux so, didn't want. I mean, the, the excuse was that we need UEFI because Windows wants it, and now we want UEFI because Linux wants it. And and I I have a friend at Arm. I I was I was pushing hard on him about why are why am I only hearing about UEFI from Arm nowadays? And he. <laughs> He said, because Linux. And I said, what? What? He said, well, Linux requires UEFI. Or that was, that's their, their argument. I ought to mention that um, we ha I have been looking at some ARM boards that run UEFI, and we're pretty close to being able to say, not that we will add Linux kernel to UEFI the way we do on x86, but that we will completely replace UEFI with a Linux kernel and uroot, and, and it's just gone. For right. ARM. And, yeah. and that, that's, maybe great. that's kind of where we want to be. But now getting into RISC V, there, there are some aspects of RISC V that I've always been not exactly thrilled with. One is called the Open SBI because it's basically a classic BIOS interface, and I don't right. know why you would do those. Um, there are a few architectural hooks in, in the RISC V nowadays and more recent models that explicitly sort of enable the SMM model on the RISC-V. Which is tragic because I think that RISC-V has done such a good job of learning from all of the microprocessor mistakes from an instruction set perspective. Yeah. I mean, they've really done an, a, a very admirable job of like, here's what MIPS did wrong and here's what Spark did wrong and what Power oh. did wrong. And it's, you know, and not repeating those mistakes. Yeah, they, they really are brilliant architects on that thing on that thing um, but then then to repeat these mistakes on the firmware side is just gutting yeah it was a bummer so what we're doing we've started and, and that code's written in c and you know hmm. i every time i see new code written in c i just have to say why are you doing this why would you ever do this and huh. it looks like every other c piece of firmware with all the things that implies so we're taking a very different tack now on risk five we i've started a project at called Orboot back in March. We're big fans. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so for anyone who hasn't heard of it, Orboot is a downstream fork of Coreboot, but Orboot is Coreboot without C. So we downstream fork Coreboot. We did a search and destroy on every bit of C code. The new code's all written in Rust, but we do use some of the Coreboot assembly code because it's good code. Yeah, right. And we do use the Coreboot utilities because they're fantastic utilities. But where we where we can, we, we discard things we, you know, from Coreboot that we feel were no longer needed. So uh, that is now, we have used that to load kernels on the sci fi five five Freedom U board, which is the one based on 64-bit. I have and, one over there somewhere in oh, one okay. of those bags. Uh, well, here's here's the slightly more exciting news. Now that Open Titan is, you know, we're allowed to talk about Open Titan. Very exciting. As, yeah. Um, and yeah, I know, if it, Appreciated your, you know, your support of it, actually. Yeah, uh, no, the, we were, it's something we were been very excited about, very excited to say. Yeah, so so uh, we are now compiling Orboot for the Open Titan. That hey! is dope. Oh, that's, hey, so that's good cool. news. That's great that's news. That's so cool. Yeah, wow. And um, we actually are finding bugs in Rust. Well, oh, which, which that's exciting. We've, we had a number of bugs all based around Atomics. The, the oh, most, interesting. Yeah, take yeah, a look yeah. for yeah. the most recent one based around Atomics on RV32 because... Yeah. Open Titan is what's called an RV32 IMC, and there's no, it's not iMac, it's IMC, it was right, no atomic instructions. No, no atomic support, yeah. And Rust, it turned out the compiler had a bug and it would incorrectly handle uh, processors without atomics. Oh, it's, a fun, it's a fun bug. That's, uh, that's oh, a great cool. one. Yeah, yeah. I, I would love to go look at that. It, it, it's actually a little subtle, but um, I, I had to I read can the imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. It, it's the difference between saying um, a, a thing is none or is value of zero. Oh, interesting. So yeah, take a look at it. You'll love it. Um, cool. Anyway, so our intent with Orboot and then is that on a machine with privilege mode, we want to load a kernel that will run in M mode as an experiment. And this goes a little bit further. Um, we're experimenting with running in M mode. And so the different User, modes. So, and, and M, M, M is machine mode. It's essentially it's SMM. SMM. Right. But what I never viewed the ability of the operating system to modify M mode code as a bug. A lot of people did because <laughs> I wanted the operating right. system to own that mode. Absolutely, so, amen. And preach, and yeah. So, so there, there's a really um, Jeremy Fix Harding who's written the Redox operating system in yeah, Rust. I've right. talked to him about yeah, this, yeah. and kind of went got got the sanity check from him because he's really good, and and said, look, 
we'd like to run the kernel in M mode, but with user mode, you know, with, with paging enabled. And he likes, he's, he said he liked the idea because think about this. I'll, 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 I'll go from my kernel or my process to M mode. I don't have to do any TLB flush. I don't need to lead, load or page table root because there's no paging in M mode, basically. Um, I can use their memory protect area registers, which are basically segment registers without an offset. No, it's, it's a bounds, but not a base is one way to think of it to protect bits of the kernel. And, you know, the question is, really, this is kind of a research question. Do I lose so much by not having paging enabled in the kernel hmm. that it's too far to go, right? Or yeah, do I gain so much by not having paging turned on that it's really worth what, what I lose? This right. is an unknown question, right? Right. I think it depends on how much your kernel is going to be doing, honestly. I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, if you've got a big kernel that's going to do a lot, it's going to get more and more difficult to not have paging enabled. This would be my... That's that's kind of our speculation. Yeah. But, but on a on these little tiny, you know, RV64s, right. It, right. we may never care, right? Well, for, I mean, for Open Titan, you may... Well, probably... Open Titan won't even run Linux, so we're fine there. Yeah, right. It, right. It'll be running something else. But I, I do think that... Um, we need to step back a little about, you know, what is a kernel and what does a kernel do? And does it need things the way we're doing them now? Or yeah. do we need to rethink this? Because a, a, the, the other fascinating thing that RISC V opens up, I can build, and I, and I know someone is doing it, I can build a machine with 1,000, 2,000 cores. Right. Right. One of the reasons I can do that is I'm not paying a per core license anymore. Yeah. Why didn't anyone do that with ARM? Well, you can't do it with that x86. It's too complex and big. Yep. ARM conceivably you could do it, but, but you it, can't pay it. The right, right? licensing costs are um, too great. So, well, okay. If I have a thousand cores, should I really be timesharing cores anymore? Yeah, interesting. Right? So, oh, well, wait a minute. If I'm not timesharing cores, then did I need a virtual machine capability? Huh. Yeah. Well, I'm not sharing cores. And virtual machine is all about sharing Yeah, you do core, wonder, like, right? what does that pink look like today in Risk v <laughs> Yeah, Right where you yeah. the, the, uh, you may have hundreds of thousands of cores. Yeah. All, so yeah, interesting. So RISC V, and and this is a thing that that people get a little mixed up on. RISC V is not an open source core necessarily, right? You can make a proprietary RISC V and not violate anything. It doesn't mean that firmware has to be open source. It just means that you don't pay a nickel or whatever for every core you lay down on a die. Right. And that one simple fact opens up so many interesting possibilities. It's just, you know, we're, we're just seeing the beginning. I mean, a friend of mine got a $3 risk five board from China. Funny thing about the risk five board from China, it has a camera and a GPU. Guess what they're going to use those for? But you know, um, <laughs> right. the, the, the thing is, say uh, cheese. yeah. Yeah. Or don't say cheese. Yeah, right. right. But, but in any event, um, you know, it's, it's really exploding from what I can tell in China. And, but also, you look at the most recent sci-fi processor. That's pretty interesting what they've done there. Not not the 540, but the next one. Yeah. And I and I want to try and understand better what they've done. But they've had some really cool ideas. So, I think you're going to see a lot of really innovative things coming down the pike around the RISC V. It, it's sort of like it's opened up our ability to do innovative things in hardware again. Well, yeah, and yeah, I totally agree. And especially as we increasingly get parked to that seven nanometer node. Because I mean, I think well, I think yeah. the sci five guys, I think they're at like 28 nanometer, maybe even lower now. And it's like, it wasn't that long ago that that was leading edge process. Right. If I think it's reasonable to assume that we're, I mean, maybe, I mean, TSMC thinks we're going to get to five. I, I don't think what it's going to, I mean, a silicon atom, I mean, the 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 Van der Waals radius of a silicon atom is, yeah. is 200 nanometers or 200 picometers rather 0.2 nanometers so like we're not getting too far beyond five say. right right and then as we get more and more fabs parked at that node it's going to be possible to fab a risk five at the same node that you're fabbing an amd microprocessor yeah and, and the thing is so i used to make this argument at los alamos you know we would run the supers at five percent efficiency and i'd say well there's there's a couple of ways to double your performance one is Let's find ways to be a little bit more efficient, ten percent efficiency, right? Or, or we'll go spend a hundred million on a new supercomputer or whatever. But I think there's a similar argument around processors, right? You can either continue to make your processor more complex and do more, but that's a losing game, yeah, right? As we run out of, you know, rule. So, 
you know, our, 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 our node size. So, or we can say, Hey, let's do a dramatically simpler processor. Right. And then try and figure out what happens when we tile many, many, many of those on, on our die. So, Things, right, so things are getting AMD, interesting. Yeah, this is what AMD has done, right? Where you've got a seven nanometer part sitting on oh, side by side with a fourteen nanometer part. Yeah, that's really neat stuff. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the kind of the two point five D stuff, and it opens up a lot of possibility there. I mean, it's yeah. definitely it's definitely interesting. This is what I think the the, the end of Moore's law is actually going to be exciting. Well, it'll bring us back to an age of limits, and 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 arguably. That's when the innovation starts, right? It, it, if you can just throw more memory at it in a year and a half, you don't have to be smart, right? But back in the early Unix days, you know, you had to be smart, and and a lot of a lot of people came up with a lot of really clever things, and and I think forcing limits on back on us, I think will be a good thing. I think it'll be healthy. I think it'll yeah be, yeah, be healthy for the these the, the software ecosystem we've got, the firmware ecosystem we've got. I, I actually had a friend at Intel told me a funny story of really apropos. He had a graphics stack on the processor on on a on a gra attached graphics board, and the one stack I don't remember which direction it was one stack had seven layers of API layering and one stack had six. Guess what the decision was made to make them kind of meet? Oh God! You add another layer. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Right. He, he said nobody wanted to talk about like, you know slicing off right. a layer of API. They they just added another layer. That's what we all do, right? That's what we, we all do. We just we software's just, made that free. And and uh, you know, getting back to the Plan Nine discussion, the thing I love about Plan Nine is that um, the model of that was do not put anything in the kernel if you can possibly find a way not to put it in the kernel. Right. And and so, I did an ACP subsystem for Plan Nine about four years ago. And if you look, every kernel, including Minix, which is a microkernel, they take the fifty thousand or ninety thousand lines of ACPA CA code. And Linux transforms it to make it less ugly because it is really ugly. It is really ugly. And they compile it into the kernel. Right. And I thought, okay, fine. Everybody does that. But the rule is you never put it in a kernel if you don't have to. And so I kind of worked out a way to make a very minimal ACP device and run the ACP consortium code in user mode, right? Interesting, yeah. And, and so I think in a lot of cases it's really possible to do these things, but it's so easy just to like just toss it, it in a kernel. Right. Load it up, another yeah. hundred thousand lines of code. Who cares? cares? Right. You know, we've got enough memory, whatever. So we in some ways we've kind of gotten a little lazy. Yep. And and it and it so for for back to an area where era where there's sort of limits, that that's kind of cool. I think it's yeah. kind of neat. I think it, it's gonna as you say, that with those limits force innovation. I mean, that's where you gotta be you gotta gotta be creative. And yeah. And I think that's we, we it's gonna be fun times for sure. Ron, this has been delightful. Thank I've you. had fun. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really great. We knew we were looking forward to having you up at the garage, and I think it is over delivered. So thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you all. Yeah. You've been listening to On the Metal Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. For show notes, to learn more about our guests, or to sign up for our mailing list, visit us at on the metal.fm. On the Metal is a production of Oxide Computer Company and is recorded in the Oxide Garage in Oakland, California. To learn more about Oxide, visit us at oxide.computer. On the Metal is hosted by me, Brian Cantrell, along with Jess Frisell, and we are frequently joined by our boss, Steve Tuck. Our original and awesome theme music is by JJ Weisler at Pollen Music Group. You can learn more about JJ and Pollen at pollenmusicgroup.com. We are edited and produced by Chris Hill and his crew at HumblePod. From Jess, from Steve, from me, and from all of us at Oxide Computer Company, thanks for listening to On the Metal.